Welcome to Sardar TV. I'm Vishali Jain. We're excited to have Paul Doherty join us today. Paul is Chief Technology Officer and Innovation Officer at Accenture, a business consultancy. He's also the author of a book called Human and Machine, Reimagining Work in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And he's here to tell us more about trends in business and technology. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you with us today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. I kind of came in the door through technology. I was, uh, I've always had a passion for, for technology and studied technology in university, software engineer, and uh, joined a, a company called Arthur Anderson 32 years ago, and I'm still at the same company with a different name, different form today as uh, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at Accenture. So did you climb the ranks? Yeah, I started as a coder. You know, I, I love to program, love to code. That's what a, was my thing, and I thought I'd do that for my whole career. So I joined Accenture and started pro, you know, what it was at the time, started programming right away. And um, and I thought that's what I'd keep doing. And then I really, as I got engaged in applying technology to solve you know business problems and drive different outcomes for companies, I you know, got tuned into the fact that this is really fun and could really have an impact on companies. You could really see the results very quickly of helping a company do something better, more effectively, improving things for their workers or their consumers or for citizens, and got me hooked on solving problems and then you know, kind of started to realize I could solve even bigger problems with by, by taking on different levels of responsibility, and that got me to where I am today. Tell us a little bit about what your role as Chief Technology and Innovation Officer entails at Accenture. Yeah, now I've been Chief Technology Officer for about five years and Chief Innovation Officer for about 18 months, and the two really came together with the realization when my, my boss, our CEO, Pierre Nanterm, called me and said, a lot of our innovation is driven by technology, and we want you to be on the front lines looking at how technology and innovation come together to drive the future for Accenture. So that's why the, I have the two titles. And the, the real objective, you know, simply put, I've got a lot of different objectives and things I do as part of my role, but the simple objective is to look at how do we take advantage of technology and position Accenture to be in an even better position with all the exciting things that are happening with technology you know, with each year that goes by. Some have a set of responsibilities that generally entails our technology direction, our R&D, our investments and all the innovation that we apply as we look to drive our business. You do head the um, all the activities of your R&D lab, right? Accenture Accenture Labs. Yeah, Accenture Labs. And, and the way to think about the way we drive innovation at Accenture, Accenture Labs is part of something we call our innovation architecture. One thing companies really struggle with is how to turn innovation into business impact. And that's what we've addressed through our innovation architecture and where we say we can go from research right through to, to revenues in a very streamlined fashion. So the labs is part of an innovation architecture. We start with Accenture Research, which is our thought leadership points of views and such. We have Accenture Ventures, where we drive investments in early stage companies to innovate faster through other organizations. Then we have labs where we get our own researchers with our hands on applied here research and technology. Then we have our Accenture Studios where we co-innovate with clients and then we take that through our Accenture business. And that end-to-end -end integrated innovation architecture is what we think allows us to kind of uniquely in our industry quickly take ideas and turn them into you know, results and revenues you know, for our business. So there's uh, various different streams that that eventually gets to the, the, the consumer or your clients, exactly. right? Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit, at least with the labs, the Accenture Labs, tell us a little bit about some of the activities that have come out of that? And yeah, yeah, Accenture Labs is really, it's a great part of our organization. We have hundreds of PhD researchers who really do applied research. We're not looking to invent the new, you know, the next transistor technology that's going to change, you know, chip density or anything like that. But we're looking to at applied innovations where we can take technology out of research labs and apply it to solve business problems. That's what our, our, what our researchers do day in, day out. Just a, you know, and it's across a wide variety of domains. And a couple examples just to give, to give you an idea is there's a, there's a research program that we worked on over the last year where our research in our labs took artificial intelligence video analytics, natural language understanding, and a variety of technologies, and combined it to help the visually impaired gain the equivalent of sight and awareness of the situation around them. So it was a, it was a you know, vision, you know, kind of simulated vision with natural language understanding and communication. So a blind person, visually impaired, could walk into a room and understand, you know, I'm, I'm talking you know, to two people in the room or however many people, what's their attitude, what are my surroundings, what's, you know, what's in the room around me. And it's really been a breakthrough technology that we're using with our own employees, our own visually impaired employees to help them more effectively interact and communicate. That's an example of the kinds of innovation we put together. And then that has a tremendous amount of commercial implications as well when you look at the, the way you can apply that technology in manufacturing and many other domains. 
And what about Accenture Ventures? Tell us a little bit about Accenture Ventures and, and some, some of the types of companies and startups that you invest in. Or Accenture Ventures is our window into how do we innovate in the world outside Accenture. I mean, there's, there's, uh, we track you know, right now about 5,000 startups across a wide variety of domains and more coming every day in, in every part of the world. Um, and those, those startups we're tracking are across probably 50 or 60 different countries around the world. So with Accenture Ventures, we're looking to develop the wide lens into everything that's happening there and then find you know, the narrow uh, set of companies that really we can invest in where we can change the course of that company and we can change the course of our own results by bringing you know, Accenture and that early stage innovation together. So we tend to look for, you know, we look at some earlier stage companies, but we tend to look at series you know, B, C, D companies that have a, a real product and a real innovation that we can combine with our Accenture scale and insight and technology and industry knowledge and client relationships to accelerate that company's impact and success and accelerate the innovation of in our large clients by helping them, helping our large clients take advantage of earlier stage innovation. That's the magic that we're bringing together with Accenture Ventures. So we've done about over 20 positions over the last three years, uh, doing you know, a, a, a series of them every year. Uh, we've been you know, very successful to date in finding that unique spot where we can really make a difference in the market. You also mentioned um, Accenture Studios. Yeah. Is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Yeah, Accenture Studios is, is really where we get to the you know, new way of working and really co-innovating with our clients because innovation, we're in an innovation economy now. Innovation is what every company wants to do. You ask a CEO what, what they want to do to drive their company and they'll, they'll mention innovation and technology enabled innovation pretty high on the list. And the studios are where we bring our teams together across all the disciplines I've mentioned with our clients and say, how do we, how do we co-innovate? How do we take, uh, say, uh, one example, a, uh, a lodging company and look at how do we transform the, the guest experience and change the way that they do business, leveraging new technology and new way to shape the experiences for their customers. And what we do in the studios is we don't just talk about it and show PowerPoint and talk about what might be, we build the solutions. You walk in with an idea, at the start of the day or a business problem at the start of the day or start of the week and you walk out at the end of the week with a minimum viable product and something that you can use to take back and implement in the business. And that's what we're really doing through the studios. Tell us a little bit about your new book. You've written a book, Human and Machine, Reimagining Work in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Tell us a little bit about what you've learned and how artificial intelligence is really shaping the way people are working today. Yeah, yeah. artificial intelligence is something we're all hearing a lot about these days. I don't think there's a person on the planet who hasn't heard something about artificial intelligence at this stage. The, uh, the book started about two and a half years ago when my co-author and I, Jim, Jim Wilson's my co-author, he's one of our researchers, leads, he leads our technology research, and he's a brilliant guy, brilliant writer, and also a researcher. And we were writing an article together, and we said, this is bigger than an article, because we were looking at AI, and we were seeing that AI had tremendous potential to really uh, augment and improve human capability. But if you think back two and a half years ago, people weren't talking about that as much. So we decided to write a book, and we also saw a lack of practical guidance for business executives. There was lots of books on different elements of AI, but there wasn't something really geared at a, a business and technology executive to say, how, how am I going to apply this to my business and, and make a difference? So that's the zone we aimed for, a management guide you know, for, for executives, and to really look at how this impacted work and the way you structured work in your organizations. And that's where Human Plus Machine came from. What industries are you seeing artificial intelligence being applied in? And, and how is it working across industries? You know, it's, the industry question is a really interesting one with AI, because I could look at every other technology. I've been with Accenture 32 years, as I said, and I've seen all these other waves come through from desktop computing to client server, cloud, mobile, IoT. And you could always identify an industry that was, or, or two that were the early leaders with it. What's different with AI is it's so broad-based, because AI really is a way to change the way business works. And we're seeing adoption in everything from utilities and in uh, oil and gas and chemicals, to insurance and banking, to retail and consumer goods, to automotive and industrial the, across the board, and including in the public sector with government services. So it's remarkably broad-based is what I'd say. And what, we, what we're seeing in the work we do and we talk about in the book is three things that we think are key to really adopting AI successfully, regardless of what industry you're in. The first is taking this view of reimagining the way you think about your industry. Uh, it's, if you're trying to just apply the same approach or re-engineer, which is the buzzword we, we used in the past, or the approach we used in the past, or automate, we, th we don't think you're going to be successful. You need to think differently about how you're solving a business problem, and that's reimagining. And the second thing you need to do is thinking about the jobs and the work you do differently 
which we call the missing middle of the, the, new, the new categories of jobs that are created. And the third thing you need to do is think about responsible AI, because AI introduces new considerations and questions about your, your consumers, your workers, and how you're doing business, the communities you operate in. And you need to think differently about how you apply the technology and things like ethics and bias and many other issues as you think about AI. Can you give us an example or a case study that you found where, where an organization or an industry actually was able to apply um, this sort of model that you lay out successfully? Yeah, you know, I think there, there's a number of examples. I think the, uh, a great example, say, is in the industrial equipment arena. If you look at what's happening there in, uh, in a, the company like, uh, say, a GE that we talk about in the book, General, General Electric, and the work that they've done in their manufacturing and operations with AI-enabled digital twin technologies. If you think about, let's say, it's uh, maintaining a jet aircraft engine uh, that's you know, manufactured by GE. In the past, a technician would have a checklist. You'd go check the engine when the plane stopped and do some maintenance and work through a process. And it was, you're typically checking things that weren't broken. It was somewhat tedious to go through and do the same thing every time. And so for the worker, it was, wasn't using all their capability. And for the company, you know, it wasn't the most effective process. You know, contrast that with a digital twin AI-enabled model. We have real-time information from the engine. How is it really operating as it's flying through the air or on the ground, wherever it might be? What might fail when? You can run simulations using AI to understand when I might need to maintain it. And the, the technician on the ground now can be in control of these variables and these simulations and make decisions like, you know, using a revenue model, should I take the plane out of service now to maintain the engine or will it be more effective to do that at the next stop? And is it safe enough to, to go to the next stop? So you're decentralizing decision making, increasing the effectiveness of that person on the front lines and their productivity, and increasing the outcomes of the company. And that's an example of all those here, the reimagining different way of working, come together with a new type of role and applying the technology in the right way that we see in industry after industry. Were they able to sort of track it to the success of the bottom line? Yeah, and I think that's what we're seeing is, is increasingly, uh, we're seeing more and more examples where companies can track it to the success of the bottom line. I'll tell you another example, very different industry. Let's take uh, banking. Uh, compliance is a big issue in banking, compliance and regulatory uh, adherence in, in uh, the banking industry. And uh, one of the big areas of activity now is applying AI in things like anti-money laundering activity which is really a pattern match matching exercise. How do you look at money flows and cus customers and what they're doing and understand what might be the indicator of, you know, of a money laundering transaction? It, seeing those patterns is something AI is great at doing. That's what machine learning does really well. Then identifying is it criminal or not, what are the, what's the contextual you know, situation around the, tr the transactions, what a human's good at. So you put AI together with the human investigator, and we're seeing dramatic improvements in compliance processing like anti-money laundering and banks. So another example where, where companies are seeing the results today of applying the technology. There's generally this fear that robots and artificial intelligence are going to take over jobs and entire industries. What has the research shown? Yeah, as part of the book, I should just step back and say, as part of the book, we did uh, a lot of research. We have a lot of experience in Accenture through hundreds of projects we've done and you know, thousands of people working out in the field with these with AI technologies. But when we launched the book, Jim and I also launched a research activity to, to talk to and research 1,500 companies that were in the early stages of applying AI to understand what they and their executives and their, their frontline workers were experiencing with AI. And that's what really led to the insights in the book. And what we really learned from that is that, um, that what's what I've talked about already, you have to apply AI differently in, in uh, the way that you go through the process. And we learned also that the results vary dramatically based on how they applied AI to the business. So the more you follow this process we talked about in the book with the, thinking about the work differently, really reimagining the work, applying it responsibly, the more elements of that you put into place, the higher the returns. And we saw returns as much as two times to five times higher from companies that followed that process in the book than from those that might have just applied AI in the traditional fashion. So those are, so those are some of the insights that we saw when we did the research. Mm -hmm. There, one big issue that organizations continue to face is actually taking the data that they have, deciphering it, and making data-driven decisions. What are some of the things that are being done to address this today? Data is the fuel of AI engines. You can't you know, do AI without the data. So data really becomes critical. And there's, there's le levels of that that need to be mastered. Part of it's just getting mastery of your data. What data do you have? Do you have the right data? Is it in the right format? Is it, is it uh, unbiased and does it lead to the right outcomes? 
But really getting to a data culture and employees who understand how to use data is, is another level of challenge that's, uh, that's something that many companies are grappling with. And if you think about the power of AI, it's in many cases, it's, it's data and algorithms that are giving you better analytics for people to make better decisions. And it, you have to get the people in the mindset of the data-driven uh, data culture. And uh, that's why the broader cultural change around how to use data differently becomes very important. In our own business, we're, we're tr retraining a lot of our people in terms of how do, you, how do we do our Accenture business differently to incorporate data-driven consulting and data-driven approaches in the way we build systems as examples. And we're doing the same you know, with our clients' businesses. You know, the other thing I'd say is with, it, with the data is that you need new skills. And we talk about these, this idea of eight fusion skills in the, uh, as part of our Human Plus Machine book and in the work we're doing at Accenture. And a number of those skills are really getting at how do you fuse together AI with the human capabilities that you can get the data and analytics capability of AI combined with human judgment and human uh, decision making to create better combined collaborative AI skills. And that's really the other part that comes into play with this data-driven element to the culture. What are some of the skills that are required for leaders and for employees to have today to be able to work in a culture like this? Well, I think one thing that's important is for, for uh, everyone in the organization to, to, to get comfortable with working with you know, data and new kind of algorithms and tools that are going to be available. And that's something that uh, more and more companies are starting to put in, in place, you know, but uh, we think is really critical. So how do you put in place the platform so people can learn about you know, the new technologies, new ways of working with, with information. Some specific skills, you know, that we identify in the book are things like uh, judgment integration, which is a new category of skill we've identified, which is if you're in a, if you're in a role which requires you to make judgments, how do you get comfortable using an algorithm, you know, using AI or machine learning to help you in that decision-making process? And it's a matter of understanding, you know, what, what skills, you know, you have and where, you know, the human judgment's important and combining that with the new input that you can get through the pattern and you know, pattern matching machine out, uh, learning and different things you can get from AI algorithms. The example I've talked about with the money laundering is a great example. It's the, the patterns detected by the algorithm that are suspected of anti-money anti laundering are part of the input to a to complete decision and a judgment being made, but not the whole answer. And training people on how to combine the two is one of the key skills that we see a, a big need for going forward. And what about the culture shifts, the organizational culture shifts that need to occur in order for that to happen? What is it that leaders need to do to ensure that those cultural shifts are happening? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a, a big cultural shift and an organization shift in many cases. One of the other things we talk about is in a lot of cases, we see decision making being pushed to the edge, the frontline workers making more of the decisions. And that means dramatic changes in the, the middle of the organization where, where a lot of those decisions may have been made previously. So there's big organizational implications of, you know, in that change that's coming. There's cultural changes in you know, needing more of an innovation culture that's able to embrace change more rapidly. And, um, and then a, a culture of continuous learning becomes very important because the way you did something today is not the way you're going to do something tomorrow. And understanding how you build that culture of, of learning in your employees and, uh, and really adaptive processes is really a key to the, the ideas that we talk about around artificial intelligence. What kinds of um, leadership skills then are necessary to make sure that the leader has what it takes to be able to drive that type of change and that type of culture? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of different leadership capabilities that we talk about. One is that um, the leadership needs to start with this idea of the reimagining the business. That needs to start at the top because you need to think about the broad scope of how you're going to change your business. For example, if we're working with a life sciences client, uh, we're working with a number of them now in, in this area, at what level do you think about reimagining your business? You know, in life sciences, it, it, the AI could change the way you innovate your drug discovery pipeline and clinical trials and other things that you do that are at the core of your business model. So how do you rethink those and how your organization is going to work at that level? And that, that type of innovation and reimagining really needs to start at the leadership level. So we need the leaders to embrace that kind of innovation. And then also to embrace you know, innovation throughout the organization because many of the best innovations will come bottom up through the organization as well. So how do you create that innovation substrate, innovation culture within the organization as well? And then finally, the leaders really need to embrace the idea of responsible AI which is uh, about you know, making sure AI has the, the 
conse you know, the intended consequences and not unintended consequences on your business. And the principles around a responsible AI, getting the ethics and inclusivity, transparency and these types of things right, really need to start at the top of organizations. Out of all the research that you've done for the book and also from your experience, what would you say are some key takeaways that you could share with us on artificial intelligence and business transformation? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, uh, is the three key points that we have in the book. You need to think differently about the business. It's this idea of reimagining. You need to really embrace this idea of jobs looking different and, and embrace the idea of learning platforms and reskilling the employees to be ready for these new jobs. And then embrace response and, and instill this new uh, responsible AI set of principles to make sure that you're deploying AI in the right way. And those are the three key things that we think every organization needs to get right. How is artificial intelligence changing the the notion of work and the relationship between management and their employees and the leaders. It's it's really this learning point again that the whole organization has to become a learning organization and the processes are becoming adaptive and fluid like a a uh, technician using a digital twin technology in a in a factory or a manufacturing process uh, or uh, workers in a customer service organization using using uh, chatbots and virtual agents to help serve customers better and get better net promoter scores and things like that. It's about continually learning you know, with, your, with the employees and the leaders and workers you know, come together, creating that culture and creating the platforms to help the, you know, the employees learn new behaviors, new processes, new ways of doing their job continuously. And that's what we really try to emphasize in these, in these new ways of working. What are some f trends that you're seeing as potentially occurring in the future? based on some of the research that you've done today. Uh, you know, and it could be entailing different industries or it could be across the board. What are some trends that you foresee? Yeah, I mean, I think the, if you think about the future and what it entails with AI, I mean, there's some, some massive changes ahead in, in kind of many, many, different, uh, many different ways. One, one thing that, you know, that, we've, that I think about a lot is the way that, uh, the way we interact with technology changes. You know, we're talking about human plus machine. And you think about the way we as people or humans use technology today, it's quite primitive. We type with our thumbs on little phones and we type on these keyboards that were designed to slow down our pace of cognitive interaction so we didn't jam up mechanical keyboards. I mean, the, the way we interact with technology is really primitive. And in some, sen you know, some senses, I'd say we're, we're kind of slaves to our technology today. And really the power of human plus machine is more, you know, the AI is giving us the ability for more human-like ways to interact with technology, which really unleashes our human creativity, our human capability, our human productivity. So as you look going forward, I think what we're going to see is you know, the idea of interacting with these devices the way we do is going to seem like as primitive as using a rotary phone or you know, phones on the wall and things that some of us might have grown up with. And we'll see the interface disappear. You know, we'll be interacting naturally with our, with our assistants who will know our preferences and what we want to do better than we know ourselves sometimes. And that's not a threat or dehumanizing. On, on the contrary, it allows us to be a lot more human, leverage our human interaction capabilities, our emotive you know, response capabilities, our collaboration capabilities, our generalization abilities and ability to cross domains in terms of interacting exchange knowledge. And that's tremendously powerful and something we should all embrace and look forward to. And that's one of the, the big changes that'll come about. Another one just to, uh, to talk about, it, I think is you know, another area where there's gonna be massive um, implications for AI is, is in health and human care professions where there's, uh, we've just started to see some of the implications with interesting, app, interesting um, uses of AI to help patients with depression, as an example, by understanding what might be the triggers and causes and symptoms and helping respond to them more quickly. Uh, cases where uh, AI is being used to help autistic children communicate in a more comfortable, safe fashion than, than other mechanisms. Many, many other examples. There's, there's interesting work we're doing with the elderly to provide unique ways for them to communicate it, given uh, different patterns and habits and ways that they may want to, uh, may need to interact to get services. And I think this idea of using technology combined with human services to really solve many health problems, many societal issues that we have, uh, are, is going to be really powerful and open up entire new industries for us around care professions and solving different uh, health outcomes and situations more effectively. There's a lot of technologies that are kind of dazzling today. We, we live in an amazing time. We just look around us at what we have. We have these smartphones that have more processing power than the entire space program of the, you know, of the 60s. We have uh, drones uh, flying around. We have uh, cars already that have self navigate some, some degree of self-navigation uh, capabilities and potential autonomous vehicles that we're talking about. 
many, many other you know, mind-blowing things. The common ingredient of a lot of these things is artificial intelligence. And that's why I talk about AI as really, really being the alpha trend that drives all the other trends that are happening. And that's going to continue to be true for the next two years, five years, ten years, and probably a couple of decades. AI and the way that we as people interact with technology at a different level is going to be the story of the future. And it's going to reshape business and the way we work and live more than any, any information technology that we've seen today, more than you know, desktop computing, more than the internet itself. And we think it's going to be more akin to the impact that something like electricity had. Because it's electricity, if you think about it, spawned a whole variety of new things. Who, who would have thought because of electricity would have microwave ovens, uh, electric dryers, uh, would it be able to charge smartphones remotely, and all the other things that have happened and new, you know, uh, uh, MRI machines and new, new, new health outcomes that we can get by electricity-enabled innovation. AI is creating a cognitive level of similar innovation that's going to spread through the industries we have today, as well as creating new industries, which is why, again, we call it the alpha trend, and we think it needs to be on everybody's radar as you think about planning for the future. Yeah, there was a study recently that was done that showed that 70% of jobs that we do today won't exist, and, and the future of jobs I don't remember exactly how many years down the line, but you know they don't even exist today. The the, the types of jobs yeah. that they're going to be in the future um, don't even exist today. You know, think about it, even today. The uh, you know who would have thought, you know, say, 20 years ago, that you know, things we take for granted like web designer would be as you know, as prominent as it is today. And there's a search engine engine optimizer. I know you can go go on and on with these different professions. In addition to things like web entrepreneur, you know, people have built businesses on eBay and you know GoDaddy.com and platforms like that. So that, that's what's happened already, and we just see that pace accelerating you know, with, with you know, new kind of professions coming about quickly. But I think in terms of you know, the jobs and the impact on jobs, what we believe is that it's about 15% of jobs that are dramatically impacted by AI. It's not as much as some people think. A lot of jobs, you know, so it's fit about 15% that, that could potentially be fully automated. And that even, even that takes a lot of work and a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of new solutions to even automate that percent. The more of the jobs are transformed in some way and they're changed, so the, the person is still needed to do the job, but they're needed to do different things. And that's why we focus so much on the human plus machine and looking at how do we change, you know, help people adapt and change as they go to the way that the jobs are being transformed. Talk a little bit more about that. Your book actually outlines five crucial principles right. around collaboration with human and machine. Right? Can you talk a little bit more about what those are? Yeah, there's five principles that we found are the ones that help organizations get from today through you know where where they want to be with applying AI to their organizations. So really, five principles to establishing the you know the future business. The first is a mindset, uh, the, you know, getting the right mindset in place. And this is the mindset around reimagining and creating that uh, innovation culture that you need in the organization. So the mindset in this uh, reimagining mindset approach to reimagining the business is the first step. The second step is E, you know, the E in MELDS, which is experimentation, which is creating the culture of experimentation because AI is something you can't get right all the way at the start. It takes experimenting, trying something out, learning from that, and moving forward. So the experimentation becomes critical. The L is leadership, which is getting the leadership behaviors in place, uh, new, new thinking, new leadership around uh, how do you create the culture in the organization, everything from that through how do you instill this responsible AI code of conduct in the organization. D is around data, you know, data is the fuel of AI, and how do you get the data, uh, your data in a place where it can be the fuel rather than being the inhibitor of your progress, which is where most organizations start. And then S is the skills point of how do you get your people positioned with the right skills, and how do you view your people as a renewable resource, you're continually investing in your people so that they have the right skills and the right learning platforms to advance uh, going forward, and the, the comment I often make on the last point is that you know the best investment you can make in AI is in people, which is counterintuitive to some. Investing in people so that they're ready to, you're ready and able to use AI on the front lines of your business is where we think is going to be the differentiator between organizations who get AI right and those who struggle with AI. I think a key key point to make is there's all these various things that need to get done to make sure that your technology and your, your, your strategy around artificial intelligence is successful. It's the, the challenge of aligning all of those things to make sure that that transformation is actually successful. What are some points you can give leaders to make sure that they're able to align all of those pieces and connect them together to make sure that they're successful in their strategy? Yeah, I think one, one 
general approach that I think you need to, to kind of embrace as you think about AI is is a phrase you know we've used called uh, you know think big, start small, and scale fast, which is you know you got to envision where you want want to get to and kind of have a, a mindset in place around that. And that's the think think big part. Just, just start small and experiment and find the parts of your organization where you can experiment and make progress and get the foundations established and then be ready to scale it fast. You know, do things like address the data you know, issues in your organization, address the skills, platforms and such you need so that when you're ready to, 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 to you know, take it big time, you're ready to scale fast and take it through the organization. So that, that you know, think big, you know, start small, scale fast is something I think really applies and is relevant for AI. What have you seen are some of the biggest barriers to a successful digital transformation? Yeah, the biggest barriers I think often come down to, you know, to uh, to people and, and getting the, the people right in the organization. It could, the, um, it, it's you know, if you start with a clear vision and a path around you know, the vision being communicated to the. You know, to, throughout the workforce and the workforce understanding, being able to drive the vision, that's the path to success. I think where sometimes uh, organizations fall down is, is a gap somewhere in between. The vision wasn't clear or that people didn't get the vision and some you know, things fall down in between. Uh, there's other things that sometimes go wrong, but I think that's the most uh, most common thing. So what we really try to make sure is in place is, is the vision clear, are the outcomes very clear, do people need to know, you know, do people understand what they need to do, and is there right, the right investment in that those change programs, the right investment in the people to drive the change through the organization. Now, what advice do you have for small or mid-sized companies who might not have big budgets, but want to take advantage of some of the technologies out there? You know, I think the AI is going to offer some really interesting potential for all size businesses. And I think for you know, medium size and smaller businesses and also entrepreneurs, I think the, p the potential for AI is going to be, is today already and will continue to be vast. The reason is that uh, we're seeing the approach with technology where AI is really being democratized in a lot of ways and access to AI is being democratized. So you can go out and use uh, Vision API from Google or use open source uh, uh, natural language uh, understanding technologies and pull together very powerful technology very cheaply. So access to the technology is going to really be democratized. We continue to see the trend in that direction with the investments the big platform companies are making with AI. And that will enable not just big companies to take advantage of AI, but small businesses to use, you know, to, to combine power of all those investments in those platforms to do exciting things for their businesses. A great example is um, you know, a, a story uh, that, I, that I followed about a small farmer, a small farming, who's an American, I think it's an American family farm, and the, uh, one of the children in the family found out how to program a little bit of Python and use some vision APIs and took some pictures of their crops they were having problems with, fed it through a machine learning engine uh, and learned using very simple technology and using his phone and some simple APIs from, uh, that, that had AI capability, what problems they were having with disease in their crops and were able to then fix it and move forward. So you know, with, it's, that's the, the power of democratizing access to AI. The challenges we have to deal with are making sure that those platforms remain open and that uh, we have the availability of the data you know, widely available to people who need to solve problems. But with that in place, I think it's a you know, tremendous possibility for smaller businesses. What are some metrics that are used to measure the success of any sort of digital transformation program or, or artificial, artificial intelligence design? Yeah, and I think the, it's really important to, um, to measure a number of things in, in a balanced way. I think the, some people start off with, with, with digital technologies or, or AI and they, they, they look immediately to the, the bottom line and efficiency and cost. And that's the right thing to do and that's a good thing to do. But you also have to look at the growth side of the equation. How, you know, what new products can I enable? How do I enable growth? How do I enable better cross-sell of my products? Whatever might be the metric in your industry. So the path to success is really looking at a combination of the, you know, how do I drive the bottom line effectiveness? How do I also look at where I can drive growth and innovate and, you know, drive new business through AI, digital, other digital technologies? And then you also need to measure, I think, the human capability that you're creating. Are you, are you creating the right um, human talent that understands how to apply the technology and continue to drive it through the organization? And when you get to things like AI, I think there's some very interesting things you can me measure, like am I embedding AI in the right processes? Where am I using AI models to make decisions? Am I pushing it in the right parts of my business? And I think measuring 
the impact of uh, using the technology in that way can be a good guideline to make sure you're pushing the change in the right way. We talked a little bit about organizational culture and the need to shift an organizational culture to adapt to these digital transformations. What would you say are some of the biggest barriers to making sure that something like that can happen successfully, that the shift can happen? For the organizational change, it's um, there's, there's a number of things, especially when you think about AI, there's thinking about uh, what are the new roles that are going to be created in the organization. We talk extensively in the book about th the, the missing middle, which are the new jobs that are created, which uh, you need to outline in advance and start to educate the workforce on so that they understand what the future looks like for them. So I think in a, you're looking at an AI-driven transforma transformation, helping the people you know, doing the work understand what their the, the new jobs and new work is going to look like is a, is a really a key part of success. And then uh, understanding how to really help people through that process. What new skills do they need to learn? If, they have, if some of the tasks they were doing are now done by AI or impacted by AI, how do they learn the new skills? It might be using new tools. It might be some more analysis than they did in their, uh, in their jobs in the past. How do they you know, get comfortable with those new types of skills in the jobs that they have? That's, you know, that's, that's a, a critical part of the equation. And, um, and then uh, you know, making sure that the right, uh, you know, the basic things like the right technologies are in place you know, to, so that, the, um, so that they, they have all the right support that they need and that the, the jobs are, you know, and that the roles that they're playing are automated in the right way. Those are some of the things we think about, combined with you know, really understanding the journey that they're going through. What we're finding with many AI programs is it's, it's multiple steps to get there. You might start with applying, say, in a customer service organization, you might start with some chatbots or virtu virtual agents, conversational AI. You might move on to increasing that where the... Um, the employees are using that, you know, the, the uh, customer service agents are using that technology in different ways to interact with consumers and start solving other problems and taking on other types of tasks in the call center using that type of technology. And um, how do you make sure that you support that progression along, you know, along the way and um, learn from each step and embed that in the, you know, the next step that you do? You also serve on a number of boards, Girls Who Code. University of Michigan. Tell us a little bit more about your role and what the mission and the purpose is. Yeah, well, they're, they're very different roles and purposes in different cases. I serve on the Girls Who Code board, and that uh, is really a fantastic and, uh, and uh, amazing experience with uh, Reshma Sajani, the, the founder, and the, and the rest of the board. And uh, that's part of a broader passion that, I, that, I've, that I've had and commitment that I've had around inclusion and diversity in technology. I think the if I, the way I think about technology is um, it's, it's reshaping the way that we work and live in the world. And we're, given that we're reshaping the world, we better be doing that in an inclusive, diverse way so that meets the needs of everyone that we need to support you know, in the new world that we're moving into. And that's why, or, and, we, and we don't have that kind of, that kind of um, you know, that kind of makeup today if you look at the technology industry and who's designing the technology. So we need more women, we need more underrepresented minorities in technology and the stats would show that we're, we're, we're on a very slow path to correcting those issues. It might take decades, it will take many decades if we don't change something, which is why I believe organizations like Girls, uh, Girls Who Code, Code.org and many other organizations are really critical to make sure we accelerate the progress and uh, make computer science, uh, things like AI available to all. And other great organizations, AI for All, that we're supporting, which is Fei Fei Li's organization dedicated to making AI education available to everyone who needs it, women, minorities, and others. So it's um, something I, I think ha we have to get right, and now's the time to really focus on it and get it right so that we're, we're building the right workforce in an inclusive way that's gonna really shape the experiences that we have in the future. Are you finding that there's a skills gap when you're hiring talent for various positions? Yeah, uh, there's uh, definitely a, a skills gap and a technology skills gap currently. I think we're, the statistics we show, I think we're short 500,000 jobs roughly, uh, 500,000 uh, people for, for open, you know, open roles for computer science right now in the U.S. today. Uh, same, in, uh, same type of uh, relative you know, shortage in other countries. So we definitely are short technology jobs today. But we need to think about things like AI. We need to think about the balanced jobs that we, that we need and the balanced skills that we need as well. It's not all about STEM jobs and computer science and coding. We talk a lot about in our, in our book and the other work we've done about other roles, uh, technology enabled humanities. We, we're going to need more sociologists, psychologists, drama majors, storytellers to shape these experiences with the AI. And I, I don't think we're doing enough on that front now. And uh, so we're already have a shortage of 
good uh, you know, experienced designers and, and roles like that. But we're going to, I think, see even more of that as we have AI advancing in business because I think we'll fix the technology shortage in a lot of ways. There's a lot of focus on how do we build more technologists. I, I'm more interested in how do we fill the need for all the people who are going to shape and design those experiences, which isn't necessarily a technology role. It's about you know, more of a human role in shaping those experiences. And it's about being able to align the two, right? So how do you align that aspect of it, the storytelling and the psychologists, the sociologists with the technology and the technologists to make sure that you're accomplishing what it is? No, exactly. And we're seeing that even, um, even today in the work we're doing. We're hiring roles in Accenture today for uh, personality designers for virtual, for virtual agents. And if you think about it, if I'm... If I'm a company that's deploying a virtual agent, say a chap on the front lines of my business, that is my brand to the consumers who are working with me. So if AI is my brand, it better behave in the right way. It better interact with the customer in the right way. It better uh, have, you know, show the right kind of response. You know, if I'm a, if I, if I'm a you know, media company or something, it might be a more snarky, edgy response than an insurance company, which you'll want to be a maybe more staid response. How do we embody those values in AI? That's not going to be a program or a technologist deciding that. That's going to be a might be a sociologist or a psychologist, uh, even a poetry major, that the kinds of skills we're hiring in our company currently to shape those types of things going forward. And that's a classic example of the jobs we talk about in the missing middle. We call that a trainer job that we're going to need you know, in organizations increasingly going forward. And we're all, already seeing demand for it today. Tell us a little bit about how Accenture invests in its employees and, and how much do you spend on, on investing and training your employees? We believe that you know, people are the key to our future. We're really a talent-based business, and what we've uh, what we've been doing is investing uh, over a billion dollars a year in in uh, the learning platforms and in our people. And uh, it takes the form of things like uh, training you know, over 200,000 of our people uh, just in the past uh, year or so in new IT development techniques, including AI, machine learning, and other things, to make sure that our people who have who experienced in other forms of technology and grew up you know, doing other types of technology are ready for the changes that are coming. That's just one example. But basically, it, we, we, uh, we view the future as having the, the right learning platforms, the best learning platforms, so that you can equip your people to continually learn going forward. Um, too many organizations, I think, think about the people as as an uh, expendable resource. So if I my business changes, I you know we'd lay off the people and we get a different group of people to do it. And I really don't think that's going to be a, an effective strategy or a viable strategy for the age we're moving into because the business is going to change so fast and technology is going to be changed so fast. You're not going to find the people on the market. You better have the right platform to renew your own people and invest in your own people to make sure you've got the talent to drive your own success in the future. So that's why we're investing in our company, the billion dollars in, in our workforce, which is over 440,000 people right now, to make sure that they're all ready for the changes that are coming. Can you give us an example of how Accenture is doing this? Yeah, no, a great example is in our uh, operations business. We have a, a business process outsourcing business. And about roughly three years ago, the leader of that business started it with a vision that, it, that we started communicating to the employees, which was, you know, help us understand what you're doing that's repetitive and where you're doing the same thing day in, day out. And we're going to work with you and we're going to automate those and then advance your capabilities to do other things in the organization. So we started with this, the vision of automating the, the repetitive work. And, uh, and that was took the form of automation, analytics, and AI types of capabilities to, to automate the work. So we started with 100,000 employees doing this, this basket of work about three years ago. Today, uh, we're doing that same amount of work with, you know, with 40,000 less people doing that, that set of work and uh, basically automated 40,000 of those roles. Those people are still all employed with Accenture, and they've moved on to help us develop other services using their capabilities. They might have previously been doing uh, mortgage, in, you know, mortgage uh, application input and processing, things like that. They're now doing mortgage advisory services because they took their domain and applied other skills and you know, upskilled themselves to provide other services. And that business at Accenture has grown its top line in revenue. We have more than, you know, we have, uh, significantly more employees than we had when we started that journey. And all the people whose, whose roles were automated you know, were, are really still employed in, a, in a, even a more effective way, in even a more rewarding way with new jobs in the organization. And we think that's the kind of you know, mentality that organizations can take when you look at not just the automation, the cost cutting, but how do you balance that with creating the growth and opportunity in your business? Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of STEM in education or STEAM, 
right, incorporating the arts as well. Um, and what are some of the things that can be done um, at the public-private partnership level to make sure that STEM is incorporated into um, our education system? Yeah, the, um, you know, the, the efforts around STEM, I think, have been really critical in creating, uh, creating a lot of focus and investment and leadership in uh, providing you know, the next generation with the skills they're going to need vi to be viable and successful. So the science, technology, engineering, math, and the A thrown in for arts, you know, for STEAM, is I think critical and I think we need to continue to make sure we, we advance that focus throughout our, our educational system and that's really the foundation for a lot of the the engineering jobs and helps you know get gets the coding and all those types of skills that we need for the future and um, I'd take it even a step further than the STEM or STEAM and say that for the next generation for if we think about digital literacy in the world that we're that we're living in now and increasingly moving toward Every child, I believe, needs to be exposed to coding and have coding be a core competency that they grow up with. So beyond STEAM, I'm a big supporter of Code.org and the mission they have to expose every child at every grade level to some amount of coding computer science, you know, starting at kindergarten level you know, on throughout. And they've made tremendous progress in getting funding and curriculum change and policy in place in many states around the, the U.S. and getting federal support as well. And we're, I'm a big sponsor. We're a big sponsor of that cause. The reason that that's important is, is even if you're not gonna become a coder, most of those kids who get exposure won't become coders. They'll have a better understanding of the digital world they live in. If they go become a, an art history major, or a political science major, or a business major, or a scientist, they'll understand the world better and be more effective at what they do. It's like the equivalent of knowing what that two plus two equals four, knowing how digital, how the basics of a digital system work are essential to you know, somebody succe uh, succeeding and thriving in the world we're moving into. The other thing that I'd add on, on to that though is we need to balance the STEAM focus with a focus on enabling other professions uh, with, the, with, you know, with, with enough technology so that they're, they can add what they need to the mix going forward. And there's an there's a acronym I, that I love that I heard called HEAT, Humanities, Engineering, Arts, and Technology. So it's just bringing a little bit of a different focus than STEAM. So it's saying that you, know, the, you need to bring the technology to humanities just like we need to bring the arts to STEM. And I think that's really important because in the world we're moving into, we need liberal arts majors, we need humanities majors, we need these things more than we ever have uh, as we kind of re reshape the human experience using technology. But they all need to be more digitally aware in those professions than they currently are, which is why the balance becomes critical. Now, a big challenge that we have going forward is the gender balance in respect to technology and technology roles, specifically around uh, computer, you know, computer and digital technology. The, when I graduated you know, college in 1980, uh, 1986, about 35% of the computer science graduates were women. Uh, today, the number is about 19%. It bottomed out at about 17% a couple of years ago, and it started to inch its way back up. So it's, it's less today than it was 30 years ago, and we're, we're, we're not making ground fast enough to get to the, the equality that we need in the technology industry. Uh, there's many, many reasons for that. We've written a whole report and done a lot of research on this, but it starts with, uh, with, with exposing girls to technology and coding at a much younger age, which is why a lot of these initiatives, Girls Who Code, is a particular one I'm passionate about, but there's many other great initiatives out there that are really focused on getting girls involved in technology earlier. It needs to start earlier. We found also that role models are, are really important in getting women and girls involved in technology early. Uh, there's, there's many great role models in, in uh, technology, and even in AI today, which is a big focus for us. You know, Missy Cummings at Duke is one of the leaders in self-driving cars. Fei-Fei Li at Google is one of the leading, you know, head of the Stanford AI lab and leading researcher in, in, uh, in technology. Many, many more that I could go on. Vivian Ming is a leader in AI and cognitive neuroprosthetics and cognitive psychology. Cynthia uh, uh, Brazil, who's the founder of Jibo, one of the, the leading uh, AI-enabled agents in the home. Uh, many, many others. So we need to celebrate the role models. You don't hear as much about the women I just mentioned as we do about Mark Zuckerberg and many other uh, men in the industry. And not, nothing against the men in the industry, but we need to celebrate the women role models and make and expose girls at a younger age so that they see the way that they can change the world using coding and computer science and technology. And that's a particular passion that I've got and why I'm not just on the board of Girls Who Code, but also on the board of the Computer History Museum, where we celebrate the role, the important role that women have played in the evolution of the computing history to date and you know, going forward in the future. So you've had some great success with your book, and we know that you're donating the proceeds. Tell us a little bit more about what you're doing with them. 
Yeah, one of the conditions uh, that I had when I wrote the book is one of the first things I checked is I said I want to donate the proceeds of this book to, and specifically to reskilling organizations who are focused on helping people you know, gain the skills that they'll need to be successful with AI. And my co-author, Jim, was, was right alongside me with that, had the same passion. And uh, we got strong support from our publisher and my company and others that that was the right thing to do. And the reason is that we, our research early on identified the fact that while we're very optimistic about enough jobs being out there, and we clearly talk about the, the need for reskilling, we believe there's not yet enough focus on mid-career reskilling. The people who are past their first job, they might have a mortgage, they might have kids, uh, and, and they lose, their job is automated, and they lose their profession, and that will happen. In the short and medium term, we will see uh, jobs you know, being automated and replaced by AI. And as that happens, I think we have a, a bigger obligation as, as a society and as business leaders and, and uh, government and education leaders to provide for those who will need that assistance, reskilling, and there's not enough out there right now. So we're donating all the proceeds to nonprofits in the U.S. and other countries around the world that are dealing with that issue of preparing that segment of the workforce for the changes and helping make sure that we have an, you know, get an inclusive way of people benefiting from the technology. Paul, it was great to have you here. It was you gave given us some tremendous insights. So thank you very much. Thanks that's, for joining that's been us fantastic. today. Fantastic. Yeah, great. And we'll see you next time on Sardar TV.